Good day, everybody. It's Greg Schnell, and I am here with the June 1st edition of Market Roundup. Thanks for taking the time to join me. Lots to talk about, so we're going to get this fired up and try to get through it all in an hour. Uh, pretty wild market here, uh, down almost 10% on the big indexes. So uh, when I look um, into the breadth situation, it looks like we're near bounce levels, and, and the second component of that would be... Um, I, I just expect a bounce. I don't think I expect a big roaring rally, but I think it, the bounce might be big enough to participate. Um, Japan and Germany are just below support, so I want to keep watching those two markets to see if they start to plummet. Um, if they do plummet, I think that, that um, puts more pressure on the rest of the world because I think there's some big issues there. Um, Italy's got some problems going on as well, and the state of the financials in, in Europe is just rough. So... Uh, all of those charts look uh, testy, so we want to just stay focused on there. Again, I think the problems start in other parts of the world, not in America, but I do think they, they end up um, affecting global markets. So uh, that's kind of my bigger picture. Uh, so living on the edge or past the edge, sometimes it feels like the wily coyote and he's out over the cliff, but we haven't fallen yet. Uh, we've been gently pulling back, actually. Uh, well, it doesn't seem that gentle. We haven't had panic selling or anything like that. So it, um, it it's hard to call a bottom here, so perhaps we just keep grinding lower. We do have the first sign, a little bit of a sign, of um, positive divergence on the 60-minute chart on the S&P 500. So uh, perhaps that gets us our bounce and we can start to watch from there. Oil down at 54 bucks is a mess. Uh, copper is sitting on a 12-year trend line, so that's a problem. Lumber sitting on a big trend line as well. So uh, those are big long-term indicators, and if they start to break, I think that's a really big story. The currencies, uh, U.S. dollar continues to just grind a little bit. Uh, the, the one I'm watching the most this week is the yen. Uh, the Canadian dollar and the British pound are interesting, but I think it's the yen because uh, it's supporting the breakout that we saw in gold on Friday. Russia, India, and Australia all hit new highs this month. And so I'll talk specifically about that uh, because there is a, uh, I'll call it a weird setup going on there where all the commodities are falling yet. Brazil is holding up. Canada is only down half of what the U.S. is down. Uh, Russia and Australia are hitting new highs. So something going on in the commodities market, and we'll have to figure that out over the next few months, but that's definitely something that's in the back of my mind, is why are the commodity markets going to new lows, and yet the, the stock markets representing those commodity markets uh, trying to push to new highs. And then gold explodes and lots of focus here, so I'll try and give us some optimism of places to look for some trades. So let me jump into, uh, so what I want to start with here, uh, this is just a typical gold stock, but one of the things that we're starting to see is these Newmont mining, you know, full stochastic buy signal, and we got this on a lot of the gold stocks, so that makes it quite nice, and anyway, I'm going to try and uh, add some, some interest to the charts by uh, talking about the bigger picture on gold. And it's stuff like this, this relative strength trend line that's been going on for years. If, go if gold stocks start to break out of that downtrend, I think that's a pretty important place to think. And we saw this back in uh, 2016, and all of a sudden they had a big, beautiful surge. So first of all, um, let's just jump straight into the breadth of the market. And what I want to cover off here is... Uh, we're getting down to these levels here, this minus 600, whereas if we look across the chart, you know, there is uh, the August pullback uh, stalled there back in November 2016. That was the election low. Um, there was a Fed meeting there too that started it all, and then the election kicked in after that. But the, the big thing um, that I think is important is the NASDAQ here has put in a meaningfully lower high, and this is on the broad NASDAQ, not on the NASDAQ 100. So this to me suggests uh, something to worry about, especially for the technology um, area of the market, and that's probably what we're starting to see come out in the trade issues. 
For the high lows, uh, we're down here at minus 200. You can see that in if we were going to have a, a continued bull market rally, and I don't think we do, and the reason is because we continue to have this very low level of um, breadth where not that many stocks are participating, and we saw this back in 2015, and when the rally came up uh, in, in the middle in October, we rolled over quite hard. and we're not there yet so we could still wobble a lot more and go a lot lower um, I think the the big issue that we want to watch for here is we're down at a level where at least the market will try to bounce and then we'll see if it's successful and uh, again I think the the problems don't start in the US so I'm expecting it's the rest of world weakness like as an example this week we get all the global PMI numbers and those have been tracking lower for 16 months so um, really a bigger issue there if if global manufacturing is slowing down and we saw some rough numbers out of uh, the Dallas manufacturing index last week so all of these things add together to just suggest uh, you know there are big reasons why we could break a lot lower here's the advanced decline line for the New York composite and one of the things that's happened here is while the market was fading away um, we can also see that the advanced decline line faded away, but it doesn't look nearly as dramatic as it does on the actual index. And we have a lot lower high on the index, but we have higher highs on the advanced decline line. So that's in contrast with the NASDAQ. And, you know, my question would be the, the industrials have put in a triple top on XLI. So there's a, a specific level that... Uh, I think causes concern here and so this is one of the things that we're going to try and resolve over the next couple of weeks is um, I like the New York composite a little bit better for the NASDAQ and so if there was reason to have a little bit of optimism it's that we had this higher high in the advanced decline line but the the New York composite also has a whole bunch of other things in it so um, like that are related to bonds and that kind of thing. So it doesn't uh, show the weakness as quickly as the NASDAQ. So that's one of the things that makes us more, um, not suspicious, but watching to see how the two different indexes behave differently. So that's a, a meaningful problem there. In terms of the high-low on the Dow Jones, um, you know, we're down here at minus 200. And again, uh, I think the real problem is that we didn't get back above into this big bull market sort of behavior. We stayed here with, with a few stocks participating, but we didn't get the breadth we needed. And so now starting to break down to me, it feels like this May, June, July time frame in, in 2015. And so we'll keep watching that. Uh, the Canadian markets, real brief, uh, again, they've been holding up better uh, than than the U.S. market. So they're only down 4% compared to the U.S. around 8 or 9. Um, and so this advanced decline line, just using a moving average here, is getting down to a, a reasonably significant level. On the Canadian market, we have a lot lower high on this advanced decline line, while the market actually made a slightly higher high. But it's this lower line that suggests to me that uh, bigger problems. So we've got that on both the NASDAQ and the Toronto, but not on the New York. So here's the high-low for, uh, for Canada, and you can see that we're below zero. And the Canadian market's pretty, I don't want to say fickle, but it, you know when we start having uh, less than uh, zero, you know, the market's typically in decline. And so we're right there. We've been trying to hold this support level going across, which is kind of the, I'll call it the support level for the topping structures and trying to hold in there. And with the gold rally on Friday, there was some reason for a lot of gold stocks to bounce big. And that held up a little bit in the Canadian area. Uh, going to the McClellan oscillator, it is now broken below 400 and typically uh, that's when I expect the market to actually accelerate down. When I look, you know, we've already fallen quite a ways here from 100 to, or from 1,000 to 1,200 or to 200, so down 800. And when I look across, there's a few places where we bounced at this 200, so back in 2017 and 2000, uh, sorry, in March in August and in November and all those bounces um, you know got us a little bit of rally relief but again 
uh, market was in a big uptrend there and we didn't have pressure from the bond market at the same time. So that's one of the questions I have is, you know, this NASDAQ or the New York market is behaving a lot different than the NASDAQ. So need to be wary of that. And again, this straight move down here looks very similar. I've been drawing this black line on here for I don't know how many months, uh, probably at least three. And you can see that we're getting the same sort of behavior that we got back then. And it went all the way down to the minus 200. And that was the 2016 uh, November market low uh, where we fell into the hole and then had the election rally that started everything. So there's definitely precedent for us to drop another two to 500 points, no problem on this summation index. And that would obviously take us quite a bit lower and probably damage the charts meaningfully. Uh, n not that they're not already damaged meaningfully. Now here's the summation index just compared back to the last 10 years or 15 years. We, the one thing I had drawn in here was in 2009, after a big rally off the lows, we had the same sort of thing, but we got support right around this similar level. So we'll be watching to see if that's the kind of behavior we're going to get here and we rally out and start to make higher highs or if we actually break down. For the summation index on the NASDAQ, again, uh, when you get to minus 200, that's a place where it really the market starts to change. And so if we break down here, that would be bigger. I get the feeling, you can see back in 2007, 2008, how you had your trend line, you rallied, you failed. We have that same situation going on right now. So this is a pretty critical spot. And in my um, opinion, one of the issues we've got is the bond market is trying to tell us that there's more there. Now, I could have said that here if I'd have drawn my trend line through this particular point and if if we came up through here but that was still a meaningful decline of 20 or 25 percent so this suggests to me that we're probably going to go down and test a lot lower now it doesn't mean we have to do it all in the same week um, but the global PMIs we have employment report coming out on Friday uh, lots going on uh, to to give us uh, I'll call it data points, uh, but the broad spectrum on the market to me looks like it's it's structurally broken, and I'll show you that on the bullish percent indexes here. So uh, the Nasdaq only has 45% of the stocks above the the or on a buy signal, and when you look at these five periods where we had uh, consolidation, I'll call it where the market just kind of got stalled below the bullish area. Most of them broke meaningfully lower. Now, back in 2004, 5, 6, we had this situation where we got down to minus 35 or 35 percent, rallied up to 60, down, up, down, up, and the market ground its way higher. Maybe that's what we're in for. But I will say there's three situations where 2002, the market really fell apart hard. 2015, where the market fell apart, you know, considerably, call it 20 percent over the next nine months, and then. Uh, in 2019 we're you know already starting to break down so if, if we don't get a bounce really really quick here I think we go a lot lower I will point out that back in 2005 and 6 that this was kind of the low levels in terms of the NASDAQ the percentage of stocks above the 200 day moving average where we bounced same thing in 2010 and in 2014, 15, you know, we're getting pretty close to those levels if we're going to bounce at all. My big concern is that this rally that we just came off of was pretty weak. And, you know, maybe it's more like 05, 06, 07, but I think it's more like the October period. And the reason is because of the bond market and the way that chart is shaping up. Okay, NASDAQ 100, we're down to 40% of the stocks are on a buy signal and 56% of them are above their 200-day moving average. That's uh, pretty much as weak as it gets before it really starts to break down hard, so be very careful out here. We're, we're literally sitting on a barbed wire fence onto which side it's going to fall. NASDAQ, or sorry, the New York Composite, we're down to 45% and uh, we've got 43% of the stocks above their 200-day moving average. So with both broad indexes, the NASDAQ Composite and the New York Composite, both of those are sitting below 50% on all four metrics. Uh, really difficult for the market to make meaningful moves higher. Um, and obviously, if, if the big tech giants would turn around, that would help. But um, you know, a Apple's been pulling back, but let's not forget they also said they were going to put in $75 billion 
with a B, uh, buyback uh, going forward here. So that that's a lot of support for a stock. Um, and if they had a market cap of a trillion, just to pick a number, and they bought back 75 billion of stock, that's almost seven, well, that would be 7% of the stock they're taking back. So really, really um, significant level of buyback um, by Apple to try and hold things up here as the China tariff situation sits there. Okay, for the S&P 500, we're at 50%, and for the percentage of stocks above the 200-day moving average, we're at 50%. So literally um, half of the S&P is on a sell signal, half is on a buy, half is above the 200-day, half is below the 200-day. Couldn't fence it much more than that. And again, just looking back in history, these kind of orange arrows all point to, to trying to find support in this 50% level. Uh, the... The S&P at least got back above this bullish red line, so that was the good news. But notice how small the spire is and how fast we came down. And just when you compare it, perhaps the um, September high in 2018, uh, there's one here in 2012. Now, this, is, this period's hard in here because it was all quantitative easing pretty much for this whole block. Um, in 2010, uh, we didn't... The spire was a lot higher, but the brief spire in 2011 went up and then literally fell really, really hard. And that was on European weakness, which I think that situation exists right now. So that's why I think it's important to watch over there. And then in 2007, we also saw this where we got a brief spire up and then fell down pretty hard. Uh, going back in 04, 05, 06, uh, you know, we, these were wider and higher. Um, than the one we just had. So uh, I would just suggest that we're on a literally walking a tightrope here and we'll see which way this goes. Okay, bullish percent index for energy. This is ugly. This thing is just breaking down on all metrics here. And I think we've been saying avoid it for a long time, uh, but we're below on everything. The gold mining index, of course, had a big rally on Friday. And so one of the things I want to point out is gold went above its 50-day moving average Gold miners went above their 50-day moving average after basing for a month here. So this is a really nice, strong consolidation, and now it looks like it wants to break to the upside. We've seen in the past it's done that, but it didn't break to the upside. This has already made the break to the upside and very bullish. And the gold miners started to outperform gold um, on Friday. I think gold was up 1.3, and the miners were up 3.9. So that's pretty significant, uh, triple the outperformance. And we are bouncing off a really low level uh, for the miners. What we'd like to see happen is this get above this 35% level. That would get us above the moving average, which would be bullish. But just open this up a little bit. And what we want to see is that we get above this 50% level. That's been a hurdle for a long, 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 long time. And only in 2016 did we make that move. A couple of things happened in there. The tips moved above, the yen broke out. There was a few things. So watching for those, and I'll get into those charts in a little bit. Okay, um, options expiration is still a couple of weeks away, but we, you know, we made our high on the Fed meeting. We had a brief rally, and we made our high on options expiration. So now we come down, and we're sitting right on the 200-day moving averages for both the NASDAQ 100 and the S&P. So... Um, you know, couldn't be more fence sitting. Look at the horizontal, the flat 200 day moving average, but they both started to just slightly turn down on Friday. Uh, that's a, as tepid as we can get. And if this is going to start to waterfall here, or garden hose down, just making lower and lower and lower, uh, this would be the level it would probably do it from. So we're really expecting a bounce here or probably significantly lower levels. The one point I'd like to make is back in um, October, uh, we pulled down roughly 10%, and then we had a rally in there and then fell again. And, and so we're in the first stage of that, right? But we've pulled down, had our rally, and pulled back. These two moves are almost equidistant. So now we'll find out if, if this is the situation that's setting up again where we just bounce back up, we get back to 28.75 and fail, or if we actually... Uh, have more strength than that and can start to break out. But we have lots of red piling up here. Um, notice the buying days. There was the last four, call it the last three buying days out of eight or nine have been very low volume. So nobody interested in buying this market. And on the down days, lots of interest in selling. So um, 
it does seem that the charts are not saying to start buying here. The only thing that I have that gives me some marginal hope, let me just see if this is the chart. No, it's not. Um, there it is, that one. Um, is this MACD is declining, but what we see right now is we've made a lower low in price and we haven't made a lower low in the MACD yet close enough. It's down here pretty far, but if I just unwind the tape, bear with me on the scrolling, uh, just add a few months to this. The, the point that you want to see here is as this rolls over, um, you know, we've got a downtrend in the MACD and if that was going to start to break out, that would be helpful. So we saw it here in November. That was the kind of rally we got in December. We came off and, and broke this downtrend in momentum. And again, anytime you're, you're breaking these downtrends in momentum, I think that's important. Uh, we're testing that prior low level of mid-May. But the big thing I think we, we just need to watch for is, you know, we're below zero here, so it's a pretty weak place. But we are down far enough in momentum, similar to October, November, that if it was to start to bounce here, nobody would be surprised. And again, the real question is, do you just get a rally of a few percent and fall back? Or do we even get that rally? Because again, I think the problem is in Europe, not in America. Um, the VIX is up above 17.5, and, and you can see that that's kind of an important level going back to February and March. Uh, we had a brief thrust and then uh, have started to grind higher here. If all of a sudden the VIX spikes next week, I think that would create a full-blown uh, problem where the charts really start to break down hard and we'd have a lot more selling. Okay, um, on the month, we're down 5.87% on the S&P. Um, for some reason, I thought it was closer to 8 or 9, so I must be mistaken. Uh, the weekly outside bars here, Again, trying to hold this main support on the S&P, but these are grinding lower every week. Lower highs and lower lows doesn't look like a bull market here. And then the same thing on the NASDAQ. I would suggest it lost support of these um, prior highs that were here, and now it's falling down below. The Russell is right at support. So if there was something to give us help, it's that the Russell is down at this prior um, zone of 1450, and only in December did it break below that. So we'll see where we're going here with the small caps this week. Yeah, sorry, my mistake. So here's 5.4% um, down from the April to this first bounce, then a rally back up, and then down another 5.4% from there. So I'm not sure why. Oh, I just took this 5.4, sorry, and duplicated it. So here was the 5.4, and then I just said what would be an equal measurement move. So it's about 27.30. Um, 2735 somewhere in there if we were going to have an, an ABCD move down and you can see that the PPO is below zero historically that hasn't worked very well for us so there's not a lot of things that make us want to go on a buy signal here um, other than that marginally positive uh, divergence on the 60 minute chart uh, mentioned last week, NASDAQ was at six distribution days, and this week it had a lot more of them, which is um, higher volume day uh, on a down day than the day prior. So uh, we had one, two, three of those in the last six days. So that um, looks like distribution to me. Okay, uh, all of the PPOs have rolled over on every weekly chart, so all of those are on a sell signal for now. Um, again, if you wanted to wait until the moving averages all cross, uh, that's a possibility. But it was the abrupt move up that made um, most people get very bullish. And again, uh, it, it's going to take a lot of those moving average indicators time to roll back over. But uh, the you know things like this New York Composite, this is a monthly chart. Falling below the 10-month, and, and we're going to get into some charts that fell below the 20-month moving average. But just, you know, in 2007, that was a pretty good clue. Um, we had lots of slop in here in 10 and 11, where we fell over quite a few times. All of this was quantitative easing till 2014. And then we broke down. And then here we are in 2016, we rallied up. And now in 2018, we came down, tested it, rallied up, failed went through it, um, rallied back up, couldn't make a higher high, failed. Like there's enough technical stuff here that suggests this is ready to 
accelerate lower. Um, we still have this big uptrend in place, and I'll call it 12,000 is where that needs to hold. And we're sitting at 12,264 for the NASDAQ or New York Composite. Okay, on the Russell, and I got to get hustling here. Uh, on the Russell, you can see the PPO rolling over close to zero. It's actually gone into negative territory. To me, that's very bearish. It's sitting at support, it's made new relative strength lows. Uh, very difficult for us to get. Um, optimistic until this starts to change trend. Okay, uh, Toronto, just to briefly point it out, uh, again, holding up here near the highs and hasn't been able to um, break down. It's staying at, call it the 16,000 level, which goes right back to this prior high in 2017. So we keep working this range, but again, it doesn't seem very weak. However, you can see on the daily chart, it's now below zero in terms of momentum. On the weekly chart, uh, we're below the 10 week moving average. We've got a PPO sell signal, not a lot of things to get supportive about. And you can see that we fell below here in July, August, September, rallied for three or four weeks and then fell apart. So perhaps that's what we get now that we're below the 10 week, but um, getting below it, you know, suggests usually lower lows. So um, not a lot to be comfortable with on that particular chart. This value line geometric chart I think is pretty um, interesting and one of the things I've done is used a full stochastic and just said when was the market top and you can see that the the market top either happens as the full stochastic rolls over or on a later bounce and in this case it's on a later bounce. Here it's a little late, here it's a um, a dip below and then a bounce back up and that was over, dip below, bounce back up and that was over. Um, in 2000 itself, it was in the middle here just after, but we, we kind of had, a, I'll call it multiple efforts to make this top. And this, I, I put on a cycle line here and it doesn't, doesn't work particularly well, um, but it hasn't been horrible either. So here we have a, a cycle inflection point in 1991, in 1995, just missed the one in 1998, rolled into the low in 2003, close enough to the high in 2007, and then made the high in 2011, the high in 2015, and now it would suggest perhaps a right shoulder high on 2019. So um, lots to look at here. Uh, this chart to me um, suggests further weakness. Anyway, we'll keep rolling. Okay, I want to get to the global indexes and um, just so much to cover off. I'm going to briefly shoot into the currencies here. The US dollar didn't do anything this week, so it was pretty much flat, just hanging out, but it's really struggling around this 98 level. The, the point I want to make is the euro didn't do much. Um, had an inside week, but stayed near its lows. Um, its momentum is actually trying to turn up on the weekly chart, so that's okay. The, the Swedish Krona is making four-week highs here, and sometimes that helps gives a, give us a clue on the euro. I will say that this downward trend on the PPO, we have an upward trend, and we're getting into this zone here where they got to make a decision on, are, is it going to break down hard or break out to the top side? We saw the same behavior in February, March rally back up and then fell away again. So keep watching this Swedish Krona. I think if it starts to break a trend line, that's going to be very positive for the euro, and that'll probably help us figure out, um, you know, some of the commodity stuff as well. The Japanese yen is trying to break through this big six-year trend line, and we surged right up, closed right on the top of the bar, and you know, depending on whether or not you use this exact top here and this exact top here, this top here, you know, it's very close. Anyway, the bottom line is it looks to me like it wants to surge up. Of course, this is gold in the background and it seems to mimic uh, the yen. So right now they look like they want to break out and the PPO has broken out down here on the lower. So that says to me, we're going higher on the yen, higher on gold. Um, Briefly show the Canadian dollar, and the only reason is is because it pushed to new near near 2019 lows. There was a brief period on the first couple of days, but it's it's the lowest it's been since January 3rd or 4th, uh, breaking down hard, and it it didn't close on its lows, but again, it still was the lowest close of the 
I'll call it of the year um, since that December rally. Um, the Aussie dollar keeps wandering here. It's at two week highs, so that's a little bit bullish. We got a PPO turning up right kind of where this trend line would suggest it would. Um, you know, their stock market is still way up here. It made, again, it made new highs in May, and it's now trying to hold this breakout level of 6,500. If it fails to do that, it's going to behave like the rest of the world, but uh, just keep watching it because that's a pretty interesting one. This is a really cool one. This is the currency ETF for emerging markets. And you can see that its PPO is sitting right at zero. Now, if it starts to turn up here, that would be very bullish, and we'd expect higher prices. You can see I've got copper in here. And they track pretty well, but copper suggests this goes a lot lower. Um, and this currency had a, you know, at least it made a higher high this week, but too early to call any sort of change here. But I think this, this copper breakdown suggests that this keeps coming lower. Uh, so we'll keep watching. Now, if, if the U.S. dollar is going to start to pull back, then we would see this chart start to rock and probably help commodities. Okay, uh, LIBOR has, has been below the 40-week moving average here for a while and uh, you know continues to sit down there it's when it goes below zero that's a little bit worrisome and we'll see that on the three month in, in just a little bit getting into HYG it broke below its 40 week moving average this continues to plummet PPO sell signal not a whole bunch to enjoy here on this chart if anything this 85 level and again this is unadjusted if this 85 level can hold that would be helpful um, IEF, this shot to the moon this week, just soared. It's at two and a half year highs. But the RSI suggests that we are up near the top of the move. And, you know, maybe it's like 08 here where we pull back and then rally and pull back and rally and just kind of keep testing that. Again, my bond charts are telling me we're near an 08 experience, an 0, uh, 2000 experience, that kind of thing. So I'm, I continue to want to look to these periods, not to the quantitative easing period of flatness that we had in here. Um, the HYG IEF ratio plummeted, uh, hasn't quite taken out the December lows, but pretty much. But anyway, it failed at the 40 week moving average. That's just not a good sign. You can see the two red arrows. That is the 2011 drop, the 2015 drop, and I feel like we're in the 2019 drop. PPO rolled over at zero right at the trend line, everything we'd expect. So um, while we may get a bounce here for a couple of weeks, I'm not expecting that it's a long-term one. Uh, this breakout on the corporate bonds, uh, interesting, but the RSI is already up at 72, so this is probably going to pull back and retest that trend line first. And then um, momentum is still running very high. So corporate bonds, government treasuries all being bought. The two-year, uh, rolling over on the monthly chart, so this is the two-year yield. It's now below 50. That's a monthly close. Go back to 2000, that's a bear. 2007, that's a bear. This looks like a bear, is acting like a bear. Momentum is rolling over. My comfort level is very, very low that we're, we're changing history here. Um, the tips is breaking out to the top side. This is unadjusted. And you, it, it's busy, so let me just turn off um, the crude oil price here. Uh, well, actually, I'll just... Uh, make the opacity zero so the line will disappear. And now we've just got gold and uh, and the tips. And what is the tips doing? It's soaring and now I think gold is going to start following along. We saw this in 2016 where the tips took off and that was also where gold took off. So here we go. It took a while to get kick started but it looks to me like we're ready to fire up on gold in a big way. TLT um, breaking out. Uh, this is unadjusted but it's gone through to new two and a half year highs. The RSI is up around 70. So again, some pullback in bonds for the next couple of weeks, sure, no problem. Could get along with that. That doesn't mean the trend is going to change. Um, BlackRock Muni Fund still pointing higher here. Look at this weekly close. Just continues to push up. We're way up here in the top border. And you can see that we've done this before. 2016, we sat up here for six months and it just kept grinding higher. So it's suggesting to me the 10 years got lots of room to go. Okay, here's the yields and just crushing. This, this uh, monthly chart 
has been so helpful in just picking the big trend. And here we sit at the 40 level. If we're going to stay in a bull market, this has to bounce this month. And, um, you know, the PPO rolled over and it's suggesting hard fall. And we don't have support till this thing gets down uh, quite a bit lower. So, well, it may bounce interim month. I'm not comfortable that it's going to be more than that. My 10-year yield, um, this is a weekly chart, the other was a monthly. There's some support down here at 2%, hopefully, uh, but we're definitely in a bear market here. This is just banging on the bottom and, you know, not a whole bunch to get impressed with here. So I'd be very, very cautious on assuming this trend is changing. Um, and again, I'm expecting a bounce just because the RSI is on 70 and above on weekly charts all over the place. Um, here's the five. You're just plummeting. Uh, this red line is the bank index and it's plummeting. Um, can't use these moving averages on the red line. They're only for the, for the black uh, chart here. But the point I want to make is they follow each other pretty closely and this is dropping hard. I'm expecting the banks to continue to struggle. Um, and in Europe, that's a big problem. Okay, two-year, uh, we see the same behavior where things went really, really quiet on the two-year on the PPO, and then all of a sudden started to break negative. That's where I think we are right now. Uh, this looks so similar. Just, do you want to photocopy the charts? I don't know. Okay, um, yeah, that two-year. And this is, uh, the two-year basically fell out of the RSI 70 um, on a weekly, pretty much as we broke down in October, November, December, we continue to break to new lows. We're at new 52-week lows on all of these bond charts, so it's pretty hard to get um, bullish. Here's the three-month treasury. We're not quite on this one. This is probably uh, laggard in terms of rolling over. But to me, this is a pretty clear topping structure, uh, very rolled over on the three-month, and it looks like it's got a lot lower to go. Okay, 30-year um, just keeps accelerating higher here. No reason to kind of keep grinding this. Uh, let's go down to the spreads because there's a couple of things I want to point out. So this is my my chart that I've put together. And again, what we want is what we see is that when the stock market does break down in 07 and in 2000, the bond yields started to normalize. So the spread started to widen back out again. Well, this looks to me a lot like 07 and 2000. And it is um, starting to break down. Now, we, we still have the whatever, the blue line is the one year above the 10 year. And we have the two, three, and five down here plummeting hard. Um, eventually, they'll sort themselves out. But you can see that this is a common thing here um, when they all start to plummet. I think we're there. I, I think the bond market's clearly telling us we're in one of these already. So this 10-year line, I keep expecting to break out. This week, it tried to move higher again. I always keep checking the data. Are you sure this chart didn't break out yet? Uh, but it hasn't broken out. But when it did break out on these other trends, the move was aggressive. Like, they're very sharp spikes higher. Um, in 1990, it it broke through the line and then ground sideways for six months and then took off to the upside. Anyway, I think we're sitting here watching, and if this starts to rip at all, um, it feels to me like, uh, you know, the setup is definitely here. This is zoomed in on the 30 versus the five year, and it's trying to break out here. You know, if it got above this 670 or 674, is that pretty much gone? I would suggest so. Transports. Um, this is a daily chart. They lost support. Relative strength is at new multi-year lows. Um, again, nothing really making me positive on this chart. We closed right on the lows on transport. We broke below the major support levels. Uh, PPO rolling over hasn't quite gone negative. It's got probably another day in it before that happens if it, if it goes down. Uh, full stochastics are dipping near the 20 line. Some would say, well, that's we're due for a bounce. Wouldn't argue with that. Uh, back in 2015, you can see as the stock market topped in May, this just kept going lower. So um, we're below the 40 week, we're below the 10 week, we're below support. There's a, not, a lot of reasons here to be too optimistic. And PPO moving below zero usually marks more um, aggressive selling. 
There was a bounce back here in October where it tried to rally against the trend a little bit. Um, whatever, didn't do much. The airlines are a mess. Uh, so they're sitting here in this big three-year consolidation sideways. They're at the low end of the range, you know, if you wanted to buy them. But I think it's just, you know, this is chop. It's really hard to own and try and make any money on that. Um, and this is the big picture on the airlines. Is this support and resistance line important? I would suggest it is. PPO has gone negative. It's actually below zero and it's below support. And, you know, this continues to look like a, a bear market situation here uh, where it's grinding sideways and breaking down. Our RSI would have to touch 30 to kind of confirm that. Hasn't done that yet, but the full stochastics below 50 after being above, um, definitely worrying. And we had this bounce in in February where we rolled down I don't know how many times we'll get it but to me it looks like it just wants to go lower railroads um, they broke the uptrend line here sitting right on horizontal support pretty important place on the chart actually um, especially the one thing I think about railroads is they're a good examiner of uh, big freight movement and uh, that can be off shipping ports or just raw steel moving around the country that kind of stuff but the PPO has rolled over onto a sell signal this week and uh, below the 10 week moving average in general that's just not that positive uh, so watch closely it's still got a full stochastic above 50 so if there was one promising sign in the transports that would be it um, here is the trucking index on the weekly. We're well below 50, well below support, below zero on the PPO. You know, everything we're watching unravel just seems to be keep happening, and this trucking one points to it pretty, pretty distinctly. I mean, it, it just made lower highs and lower lows all week, so nothing great. Automotives, this chart is plummeting uh, down around 160. If on the weekly chart, you'll get an idea of what I mean. We're really testing the 2016 lows. And if I unwind this chart, whatever, 20 years, um, pretty important level. Uh, we broke it in 07, 08, and that was meaningfully down. Um, in 2011 and 12, uh, again, the European crisis uh, was happening then and then we got quantitative easing we've been up there since then so now we're retesting this level pretty dang important um, but basically the auto data is dismal and so um, I would avoid that sector entirely General Motors has outperformed Tesla somebody had written out on Twitter over the last four years that's crazy so anyway, uh, broker-dealer broke the uptrend below its 40-week moving average. PPO rolling over at zero. This is usually a leading index. I don't like the rolling over, and I don't like the rolling over at zero. And if it spent one more week rolling over, we'd be back in negative territory after being above. That's just a bearish turn and an important place that usually marks a lot lower. Utilities. Um, bad week, really. Uh, we had a big breakout above two-month consolidation fell apart and came all the way back down and is now testing support. Keep watching it. Uh, I don't use price earnings ratios, but apparently they're very high already, so they could even fall with the overall market. Um, this is the XLI, and just look at this move off here. Um, this is a huge sell signal. PPO rolling over last week, second week down here, uh, falling apart. Scooters below 50, that's typically not bullish. We saw this in 2018 in the October breakdown, and as we started to roll, it just kept getting worse. Um, again, uh, we have a Fed meeting, we have the June um, G20 meeting. I, I don't expect anything to happen um, at the June G20. Uh, there's just... Uh, too many issues with China to get discussed in one meeting. So maybe it gets them back together talking, but um, again, uh, everybody's digging in their heels here. So we'll see. Um, looks, looks more difficult every day. The semiconductor index is trying to hold around this 200-day moving average. It jogged back and forth, but it closed Friday pretty much at the low close of the week. Um, wasn't the lowest price of the week, but it was the lowest daily close of the week. And um, again, back below the 200, the 200 is pointing down. All of that just says yuck.
Okay, this is one thing I want to point out on Australia. And the one thing, notice this big chop action. We also saw this at the bottom in 2000, and we saw this at the top in 2007, 2008. So I, what I haven't got my head around is, does it mean that we're starting to become a new bull market in commodities? Is that what I'm supposed to read into this? Or is it just a meaningful inflection point for the market? And so far to me, it's a meaningful inflection point for the market because uh, the commodities haven't started to rally yet. Um, and I have an example of that. Here is the, okay, this is how the U.S. sectors did this week. This is how the global indexes did this week. Um, you know, Brazil did pretty well. Shanghai was actually up a little bit. India and Russia um, held up pretty well, but everything else was you know, down meaningfully, multiple percentage points. And then looking at commodities, um, gold miners and silver miners actually did pretty well. Soybean and sugar were up. Um, nicely, rare earth metals outperformed gold marginally, but this rare earth metals ETF is actually an ETF of companies, so it would be more like the GT, the GDX, which is the gold miners index, and the gold miners index almost doubled the performance of our Remix. Uh, marijuana names were down seven percent on the week. Uh, that's huge. Uh, the crude oil just getting burnt up here. We're down 8.75% on the week. Brent was down 10% on the week. Global oil crashing is not usually a recipe for big bull markets. Um, and I think, yeah, I think I already covered that one. So anyway, my point would be these commodities are breaking down hard. Um, falling apart everything related to energy natural gas heating oil gasoline all just got smoked six percent um, nothing really there steel was in trouble so all of these were breaking down i'm going to go straight to gold um, to cover that off and then um, but the you know i would just say commodities are still a big avoid um, let's go find um, uh, there's nothing going on in uranium. Copper is one chart I just want to show you briefly. Um, it just keeps rolling over here. And so this is not good. But the big issue is, um, is the big long trend line on copper. Not that one. Um, if I go like this, you can just see that if we lay a trend line here, um, my word ugly is right in the way, but we're sitting right on this 2002-2015 trend line really needs to hold. PPO rolling over at zero doesn't suggest well. And again, we've been in a bear market copper. Is this a, you know, an interim bounce in the middle and now we're resuming that big bear market. So 465 to 194, that is what, 250. So 250 off three. 32, I don't even want to do the math, that's 80 cents or something, that would put you way down here. Um, so really want this big trend line to hold, and uh, you know, if, if it doesn't hold, I think that's a, a meaningful problem for the world. Just get rid of that, just take this trend line and lay it out here on this one, and that's probably a better way to focus that line. But again, this failure here at the at uh, the support level for this head and shoulders topping structure, fail, come back down, pretty important trend line. Call it 260. It needs to hold. Okay. Uh, straight into gold. Um, so the gold on the weekly chart, uh, again, I showed you the yen chart trying to break out. I showed you the tips chart trying to break out. But everything on this gold chart turned up nicely here. We made a new two-month high. Um, it was the highest close going all the way back into March. So that was really nice to see. And it was the last time that we closed on the top of a bar since way back here in November, sorry, February. Um, so this is a pretty bullish looking outcome. The full stochastic turning up here, uh, really nicely located. And again, what we'd like to see is a big bullish move. Um, we'd like this relative strength line to kind of get snapped. It, on the short term, it has snapped, so that's very bullish. The full stochastic, the first thing to turn up is what we like. But the PPO turning up above zero um, when it actually crosses, and it hasn't crossed yet, um, 
is a very bullish signal, but I think the price action on Friday with gold moving so big and the gold miners moving three times as much, the yen supporting the move, um, the tips supporting the move, all suggest that this probably has power to me. Now, you still have to use a stop, but um, it looks to me like we could start to see a nice rapid advance in gold. And, you know, that one in 2016 was 150%. So uh, try not to get too far away. Um, that was on an ETF. Lots of the individual stocks moved three and 400%. Uh, so gold here, just on a daily chart, you can see the nice breakout going back into um, this April high here. I thought it was a little further back actually into March, but um, PPO just moving above zero. That's bullish. And big picture here, going back five years, we'd like to break through this 1375. That would be very powerful. Okay, uh, GDX, GLD, this ratio turned up after spending a month down here basing. Everything, you know, what's not to like if that's going to start ramping up here, made a higher low than the September low. And again, uh, so as gold turned up, GDX turned up, it's broken its downtrend, gold broke its downtrend, and the miners, well, that's a pretty steep downtrend, but that's kind of how they've been. Um, a big move here would be really welcome. This is an interesting chart, gold versus the S&P 500. I've been drawing this out for a while, and in October I mentioned, do we have to live through another spike like this first? And we actually did. We, we rallied up, had a big pullback, and then it was that second rally that made the difference. So in this case, the rally up went to the December high, pullback, and now we're breaking out again. Are we in that same second phase? That's what it feels like to me. Um, PPO made a higher low there and ramped up we're doing the same thing making a higher low ramping up whole bunch of stuff again we've been watching this for three weeks or four weeks now uh, this is really starting to set up as a nice trade silver um, ho still holding above the 2018 lows it wasn't that bullish a week for silver but we did make an outside bar so an outside bar is a lower low and a higher high and we close near the highs that's bullish we call that a bullish reversal, a hammer pattern, hammer candle um, on higher volume than the previous three weeks. So lots of reasons to like that hammer candle. Um, SLV, so the silver miners or the silver ETF, um, down sloping trend line here it hasn't really broken out. But if that starts to pop, that would be great. And again, I've been pointing out this low volume on gold and silver uh, for some reason. I didn't put the chart up here, it's farther down. I'm, I'll go get it for you in a second. Here's the silver chart, um, trying to hold this main support going back to 2016. And, you know, a, a bump here on these um, momentum indicators would be a big deal. Let me just go get that because it's almost funny that it's not part of my uh, chart up top. Yeah, this is it. So uh, we had silent volume uh, going back here in April, in May, twice in May. And, and this really quiet volume, and just to put it into perspective, this volume goes all the way back to 2016 to make its lows. It was just under the September volume. Uh, but, you know, having three weeks make extremely low volume just says at least watch. And sure enough, uh, this week we had the big push and, you know, it's above both moving averages. It was under the 10-week here for, for two or three months and has now broken out. Uh, full stochastic turning up. Everything suggests getting on board here. I also want to point out this scooter change. And, and one of the things that happened was we were sitting here with a very weak scooter for years. Rallied up, spent a couple of months up here, pulled back, and then took off and went on a big seven-month run. Um, here we had Scooter doing the same thing, couldn't really sub, um, stay up above the 70 level, rallied up, stayed up here for a couple of months, has pulled back, and now it looks to me like we're on our way again. And so this is quite a nice bullish thrust. There's a lot of pattern recognition here where it looks a lot like this big move in 2016. I think we're just in the early days of it. If we are, this is the kind of move we want to look forward to, and again, um, Gold only moved 30% here from 100 to 130, but the gold miners moved 150%. So that's the reason you kind of want to watch the gold miners. Um, actually, let me just do it with the other chart just to show that. 
Okay, so here's gold, and we'll just change the name to GDX. It'll get rid of uh, some uh, typing too fast, sorry. Um, GDX, there we go. Okay, so this move here was from $12 to $31, and that's the reason I suggest looking closely at the miners. Okay, lots to cover off. Um, I still want to get into the country charts, so let me go do that uh, very quickly. And then if I get a chance, I'll try and uh, point out the gold stocks. And if I don't get a chance to do the gold stocks, I'll do it on Monday, because I'm on Marco Watchers Live on Monday. You can catch me there with Tom and Aaron. So um, if I don't get to it today, um, we'll cover it off Monday at noon Eastern on Stock Charts TV. Okay, so here's the German market on the weekly, and it's rolling over here. It's trying to hold above its 20-week uh, moving average, uh, but to me, the PPO is rolling over exactly where we would expect. The full stochastic is starting to break down. RSI, after a bear market signal, rallied up to exactly kind of where you'd expect and started to fall apart again. So nothing about this chart to like. Here's the uh, French market for um, on the monthly. And what you see on the monthly here is we've been trying to get through this level 5555 five, five, five for uh, you know going on a year. And briefly rallied above, have now failed, wiped out two months worth of work. We're back below the 20-month moving average. Center of the Bollingers is a big deal. And we have lots of charts here. I just want to briefly show you. Um, so the S&P 500 sitting right on its 20-month moving average. It's 27.52. The average is 27.38. So it's a pretty important place. Um, the NASDAQ, or sorry, the United Kingdom here is well above its level. But Germany has failed at the 20-month. Now, when you look back, when you um, test and fail, this can be very important. And again, I, I want to use the period 2007 and 2000 because that's the way the bond market is lining up. It's not um, this 2011 was the same sort of thing. It rallied up here, but all of this was quantitative easing, so it's really difficult to use that as a sample. And maybe we end up returning to that. Germany never got off it, um, but it's well below its 20-month uh, moving average, the dotted line. France is well below its 20-month moving average again. Um, Spain failed at its 20-month moving average, started to move down. South Korea, I have Italy on here somewhere. Um, India is holding up nicely. Brazil holding up nicely. And Indonesia, I don't know what happened to my... Um, Italian. Yeah, I just missed it. Okay, so let me go add it right here at the bottom. I'm just going to change this to be the um, Italy Dow. It'll be the last chart on the page. So we'll just uh, go to the bottom. And, and the point I want to make is it's failing at its 20-month moving average as well. So there's just all through Europe, all of these charts are failing at the 20-month moving average. That's meaningful. That's what happened in 2007 is everything kind of ground below the 20-month moving average all at the same time and in uh, the year 2000. Now, uh, let me shoot back to the top here and just go to the previous chart. And the reason I want to do that, so the S&P is sitting on its 20-month. The NASDAQ looks a little bit better, a little farther away. Um, the Russell is well below its 20-month moving average. The Dow Jones Industrial is below its 20-month moving average. The TSX is still holding a little bit above it. It's got to drop uh, 15, 829. It's 16 and change, so it's got a couple hundred points. And the Nikkei... Um, failed at its 20-month moving average. And it's the Nikkei in Germany that I think are good indications for worldwide. They kind of mimic the U.S. markets. That Those breakdowns in those markets concern me. This Australia market, again, we see it in the commodity markets have broken out. Um, I still don't understand it. So we'll keep watching. As oil plummets here, we'll find out if they get any sort of buyer stepping in to hold them up. Lastly, the Shanghai dropped below its 20-month moving average and the Hang Seng in Hong Kong, same thing. So all of these markets are breaking down in a big, big way. And um, anytime they're all below the 20-month moving average, I would express huge caution. And so if we get a rally for a couple of weeks, great, trade it, enjoy it. But uh, try not to be a buy and holder at this uh, junction. Things look way too risky for me. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye.